Hello everyone, my name is Jenny Dodd. I'm the CEO of TAFE Directors Australia and it gives me great pleasure to welcome you all to today's TAFE Talks, Learning From Each Other, a TAFE Discovery Project to Improve the Future Apprenticeships Life Cycle. In the spirit of reconciliation, I want to acknowledge that we are meeting today from various parts of the country on the land of the traditional custodians. We pay our respects to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples present with us today. Today's session is right at the heart of what TAFEs do. Yes, we do a zillion things, but one of the things that we really, really are known for and holds over 70% of the market in electric, electrical training, over 70% of the market in training of the plumbers and a high percentage of the market in most of the other trades is the way in which we deliver apprenticeship training. It gives me great pleasure today to welcome Chris Smith from ReadyTech. And ReadyTech is a corporate affiliate of Tape Directors Australia, and we welcome and thank them for their ongoing participation. They're also a gold sponsor of TDA Convention 2022, and Chris will be there himself giving a presentation at TDA Convention 2022 on the Thursday morning. So thank you, Chris Smith. Thank you for being with today. Chris Smith is ReadyTech's resident education technology futurist. That's a fabulous title, you know. Acting as a change maker for both the Australian education sector and ReadyTech's teams alike with his advocacy for future readiness through technology. As head of strategy and innovation, he brings over 10 years experience facilitating best practice, tertiary education and learning through innovation in technology, data, CX and UX, and cloud SAS ecosystem excellence. He applies his progressive thinking to the way complex education businesses can evolve the student journey and student experiences through technology and tools, as well as how they can maximize the value they receive from tech. Chris is also a thought leader, an influencer in education and, and a mentor within Australia's startup EdTech ecosystem. A lifelong learner, his interests include EdTech, product strategy, the future of work and social impact. We're very pleased to welcome Chris Smith with us today to open this seminar and then I'll introduce our other tape speakers. Thank you, Chris. Thanks, Jenny, for that <clears throat> generous uh, introduction, it's fair to say. Sounds like some of that content may have come from our marketing team, but um, look, despite my accent, I've actually had a long involvement in apprenticeships in Australia. I spent many years working for an ASM before joining the team at, at ReadyTech and focusing on developing technology for the sector. So all of that is actually now close to 20 years. So you can take the 10 and double it. I think it's uh, fair to, to claim that I'm almost at veteran status. Um, and for those that, that might not necessarily be aware, ReadyTech actually has a unique footprint in apprenticeships. We actually have the distinction of being able to say that every apprentice in Australia is managed in our software through uh, the ASINs that, that use one of our products. And we also service group training, and that provides another connection. And when you roll in the student management systems, uh, we know the space really well. We've also got a significant customer base using those student management systems. So Three of those customers are large metropolitan taste in Victoria. And in discussion, the respective CEOs and our CEO, Mark, actually agreed to explore what might be possible in terms of collaboration and, and I guess what new value we might be able to create if we work together. I think collaboration is uh, something that is long spoken about in TAFE and it continues to be a trending concept, I think, especially in, in Victoria with the sort of networked approach. Um, we wanted to take this strong executive support and test how possible collaboration actually is in practice. Because I think if we're honest, on the surface, it often seems really hard and there's always a reason not to do it. So I think in receiving that direction from the, the CEOs, it really gave us permission to, to go and explore what collaboration might be. And we actually took that responsibility seriously. So we created a work group, we drafted a charter, we set some objectives for ourselves. And I think one of the key things that came out of that initial discussion was our decision to appoint an external consultant to facilitate the project. 
So we felt it would be um, sort of more objective, more balanced. It removes some of the heavy lifting that that might be involved for the TAFEs and ourselves, specifically in drafting that sort of final asset or the findings. And I think when when you consider removing work from from people uh, in TAFE, uh, that's always pretty popular. So we decided to outsource that component and. We went to market with a very sort of basic RFP and uh, we engaged NAS Group to fulfill that role. So NAS Group effectively led the project and facilitated the project. The next decision and, and one that we'll talk about uh, in today's discussion is um, what would form the basis of the project? The, the mandate from the CEOs was quite broad, like collaborate on something, and they handed it over to, to us to sort of set what that area of focus would be. And we knew that we had constraints that were in place. And these are things that everyone in the audience would, would recognize, things like time and money and people. So we had to craft a project that could be delivered under those pressures. And that's a really important consideration. Um, we couldn't just run away um, and allow ourselves years to do this. We had a, a fairly fixed time frame. Um, we chose apprenticeships for reasons that we'll get into soon. But obviously, for, for us at ReadyTech, that was... Uh, a great place to focus because we've got really good expertise and experience in, in working with that, that cohort. Uh, on the call today, I'm actually joined by representatives of two of the three TAFEs, Bendigo Kangan Institute and Melbourne Polytechnic, and Jenny will introduce Kathy and Phil shortly. But I just wanted to take this opportunity as well just to, to, to acknowledge Jay McLennan and the team from, from Chisholm who aren't participating today, but who've made a, a really significant contribution throughout the project and continue to be involved. I think one final thing for me is just to call out that we've used best practice um, and really conscious that someone in the audience might point out the intrinsic flaws of using that specific expression. So um, I guess I want to explain what we were kind of looking to do. Uh, it was really a case of examining the apprenticeship journey for TAFEs and trying to identify pain points and crowdsource solutions whilst we're in the room with a view to sort of creating a roadmap for improvement, specifically in, in processes, but also from our perspective as the, the sort of technology partner, is how we can build uh, solutions and technology that supports those processes. And I think we're also mindful that we were bound by the journey of apprentices inside of TAFE. And we know and acknowledge that that constitutes only a portion of the overall journey. And I think that's really important to call out that the apprentice interaction with TAFE is just a portion of, of their experience of the, the overall uh, journey. So we kind of had those boundaries that we, we set for ourselves. And I think we've we've probably heard enough from me. So Jenny, why don't you introduce the, the real talent? Chris, thanks very much. So this was a collaboration between Victorian TAFEs, for those of you who are online uh, from other states. And I think what's important about this is that the Victorian system, as many of you know, uh, con continues to have individual TAFEs but who are committed to a network and a collaborative process of working together. So I think that this is uh, one, a, a great example of how that might work. The second thing just before we get on and introduce our talent is please put your questions into the Q&A. Uh, that way all the panelists can see your questions and we can manage, manage them appropriately. We will come to the questions at the end, uh, um, but, if, but during the course, if you, if you uh, can put them into the Q&A, that's great. If you forget and pop them into the chat, that's okay, but we'd prefer them in the Q&A. And thirdly, the comment I wanna make is, uh, before we introduce Phil and Kathy, is the absolute criticality for the scale of businesses we run in TAFEs of technology solutions. And I think this is where ReadyTech's value proposition is so terrific in this project, because we, we have to be able to operate as the complex large businesses that we are. So from that, let's firstly uh, introduce um, Kathy Fraser. Kathy is Executive Director, Student Engagement, International and Community Partnerships at Melbourne Polytechnic. Kathy's had various roles within the vet and higher education sectors, both in Australia and overseas, always with a focus on student experience, student outcomes and equity issues. 
Kathy was instrumental in developing Melbourne Polytechnic's inaugural disability action plan and chaired both the Institute's disability steering and OHS committees for many years. She's a strong advocate for the inclusion of all students at Melbourne Polytechnic, including Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders and those with disabilities. As Executive Director of Student Engagement, International and Community Partnerships, Kathy oversees all aspects of the student experience beyond the classroom, as well as supporting international development opportunities and community engagement activities. Kathy's qualifications include uh, a, a Master's of Science in Psychology, Graduate Diploma in Business Studies, and a Graduate Certificate in Careers Counseling. Welcome to today's seminar, Kathy, and thank you for your contribution. Our second uh, guest today is Phil Murphy. Phil is Executive Director, Student Journey Transformation at Bendigo Kangan Institute. And for those of you who are unaware, Bendigo Kangan Institute won the Victorian Large Training Provider of the Year at the Victorian Training Awards, I believe, uh, Phil, about three weeks ago. Phil has had a long career in the vocational education and training sector in Victoria with roles spanning many years in VET and TAFE from sessional to CEO. Among Phil's uh, many achievements is he is most recognized for leading the creation and operation of the Automotive Center of Excellence. And many of you will know about that Automotive Center of Excellence in Victoria and many people around the country will have visited, visited it. He was instrumental in garnering, garnering support from industry and government to develop the state-of-the-art automotive facility. Under his leadership, uh, the Automotive Centre of Excellence has transformed the automotive training industry and, um, and is a model for other similar centres with other tapes and indeed around the world. Phil is currently leading the Student Journey Transformation Program at Bendigo Kangan Institute, a three to four year program of digitising the staff and student experience through investing in students, people, systems and processes. We really look forward to hearing what Phil and Cathy have to share with us uh, today and thank you Chris for leading that panel discussion. Thanks Jenny, uh, I think we're keen to get into it. Um, so let's start with an obvious and definitely not pre-agreed question. Uh, why apprenticeship specifically? Why did we land on that? And, and Cathy maybe you could kick us off. Uh, thank you Chris and good afternoon everybody. I'm really happy to be here. I'm uh, joining the webinar today from our Paran campus on the lands of the Kulin Nation. Uh, well, look, when we came together, and Chris is absolutely right, this was driven initially from a discussion with the chief executives across the three institutes, um, where when we landed on apprenticeship management, um, that decision was made across a, a range of reasons. And really, um, I think when we look at the apprenticeship delivery model across Australia and in Victoria, there's a significant volume of um, apprentices in the TAFE sector. And all three institutes who collaborated on this project have a very strong apprenticeship delivery um, base and, uh, you know, across our various areas of delivery. Melbourne Polytechnic has um, a close to 4,000 apprentices that we deliver to um, annually. Uh, Bendigo Kangan Institute, which Phil will talk to, have about 20-25% of their learners participating in an apprentice program. And Chisholm Institute in Victoria is also a very large provider of apprenticeship training. So the volume was there to make this collaboration um, and the focus of the project uh, worthwhile in, in terms of looking at apprenticeship uh, best practice. Um, I think another factor in us deciding on this area of focus was, I guess, the complexity of um, delivering in an apprenticeship model. It, stakeholder engagement and interactions are very complex. It's not just the TAFE delivering to a single student. Uh, the engagement and interactions um, involve employers apprentices themselves, sometimes parents who, um, you know, are involved when we have uh, young learners you know, signing up in terms of pre-apprenticeships into apprenticeship programs, schools in relation to the school-based apprenticeship um, delivery, ASINs, career advisors, and everything else in between. So it, it is a complex um, approach to delivery and to ensuring that the student journey is a positive one. Um, I think also the system integration requirements are um, 
interesting too. So we've got the, uh, you know, Epsilon into student management systems. And I think it's worth noting the three institutes that have collaborated on this. We're, we're not on a common platform. Um, so it was interesting to see where the different pain points were a lot, um, you know, even across three institutes using different platforms. The complexity of state and federal reporting, and I guess the reality is in the apprenticeship space, we're providing training, but we're also um, meeting our you know, state and federal reporting requirements. So the complexity is very broad brush in that. Um, and I think some of the common uh, areas of uh, wanting to do better across each institute is we're very keen to um, improve, in, particularly in relation to feedback we receive from employers. That was one of our um, pain points, the complexity. Um, and also, uh, I guess we also put the student and the employer at the center. So in spite of our various approaches to delivery and reporting, we really wanted to make sure that um, in a future state or an aspirational um, best practice model, we're really looking at what would make the um, engagement for the employer and the student as seamless as possible, regardless of which TAFE or SMS or Point they were in their educational journey. So I think they were probably um, some of the key considerations. And then uh, just on a final note, and um, Chris, you might see whether Phil wants to join in at this point, but I think we also take very uh, strongly the responsibility as a public, you know, TAFE provider um, around meeting our community needs, particularly in relation to the workforce uh, and skill shortage areas and the requirements. Um, and so if we can um, do things better in terms of what's within our control and our remit to make that student and apprentice employer experience better, um, I think that's something that would really add value um, to the sector and hopefully bring more apprentices in, um, see them through to completion and help with our skill shortages. Thanks, Cathy. That's super comprehensive. Um, Phil, just a, a quick one from you. Anything to add from, from BKI perspective? Yeah, thanks. And, and look, joining from the lands of the Wurundjeri peoples as well, from my home campus, actually. Um, so uh, thanks, uh, thanks all. Um, interesting, Chris, what happens when you bring an Englishman, an Irishman and a, an Australian to talk about apprenticeships? It's not a joke. Um, but uh, the three of us, look, jobs and skills, uh, uh, apprenticeships are very much in focus, uh, both in Victoria and federally in ev every state. Um, it's an important area. We're, we're not focusing on a dead duck area at all. Um, completion rates, we at TAFE, look, we're not, um, we see the symptoms uh, at TAFE in areas such as poor attendance um, and poor resulting and, and students uh, becoming temporarily out of trade. Um, and we understand, you know, completion rates are a struggle. We can assist. Uh, if by improving the TAFE experience, we can dial that up a, a few percent, um, uh, that, that would help enormously. So we're committed as, as TAFEs, as, as VET, to, to try and improve. Uh, and in, as, as we found out in the, in the project, particularly around areas like communication. So that's, uh, yeah, look, they're, they're my thoughts. Yeah. Uh, sure, Phil. I think it is interesting that we settled on something so complex. Um, we did have options. We did look at more simple things that we might consider. But I think the sort of overwhelming sense in the room is that we can actually do some real good with this specific area of focus. And uh, I think from our perspective, just to call out something that that Kathy touched on, um, we sort of took the perspective of student and, and employer experience as a consideration, but what we haven't yet done is directly seek student and employer feedback as part of this, this project. We actually consciously omitted those based on purely on the, the time constraints. And we do think that there's something there that we can agree to explore in the future to properly validate this work. I think it's just worth calling that out. Um, just moving on, um, I guess, one of the things that might be of, of interest to the audience is just the commitment that each of the types have had to make for this. I think one of the things that, that we talked about earlier is how easy it is to find obstacles to, to this sort of a project and coming together and the commitment that you need to make, the investment that you need to make. And, um, you know, I think, Phil, if we come to you first on this one, um, if you could maybe just 
let us know uh, just how big I thought about that investment and, and, you know, crudely asking the question, like, why would you choose to do this at all? Aside from a mandate from a CEO, yeah. like what's, what's the value for you guys? Look, I, I suppose right across the, uh, the business, we, we fully understand that, um, committing time and resources to this area, which which is bread and butter in some ways to, to the TAFEs in particular, is a commitment really about the future. Uh, we can't afford to just stay still um, with what we've got. We wanted to improve. We wanted to understand what others were doing. We wanted to have a look across the whole scene. Uh, and, and you just can't improve by sitting still and saying, we do it well enough. So we engaged at multiple levels across the organisation from those that sit at, you know, 100,000 feet to those who sit at 10,000 and 1,000 feet and then the people who are close to the business, the 100 footers. So it was senior execs down to people who deal on a daily basis with this. So it wasn't a fly over the top exercise. Uh, and hence it was a considerable commitment and um, as we saw through all the workshops and the events, uh, you will, many of us were involved. Um, and I suppose if you want to work to the future, you have to keep your eyes future oriented. And um, every TAFE acknowledged does this in some form or another. And, and this is a cohort in which TAFE and VET are leaders in, should be leaders in. It's a natural space we need to be good. It's a natural space we need to keep improving. Uh, we say VET is connected to industry and and this is it in its most basic form. So the commitment was fairly straightforward and simple for us, um, but you still have to have to move people out of their comfort zone to, to be involved. And, and, and that took some effort. Yeah, just picking up on one of the things, and I think one of the fascinating things for me, almost more of, of uh, like as an observer than a participant in the room was actually seeing those, frontline staff that you talk to those those members of the frontline teams come together in the room and share their experiences I think it's uh, fair to say that collaboration at that level is not always possible or it's not happening frequently and I think just observing those conversations was really interesting insofar as that they had these really high value insights if not maybe the most valuable um, no offense to the executives on on the call. Um, it did feel like some of the magic was happening when when those people, it might be from teaching departments or from, say, the the enrollment teams, were, were getting together and sharing their experiences of servicing this this cohort. That to me was really interesting to sort of witness and observe. Kathy, anything that that you kind of want to add on on this piece? Yeah, um, look, I think in terms of the commitment, we're always focused on, you know, committing ourselves to continuous improvement, but the the push or the impetus coming, uh, you know, from the executive level to participate in this gave us a mandate to uh, really ensure that our staff did in, engage. I think one of the learnings for me looking back was we probably underestimated the amount of time uh, those closer to the work and the delivery needed to put into this project to bring it to fruition. So it's all very well for someone deciding, you know, we're going to do this and collaborate. And then that individual or group of individuals from the business have to add this on to their BAU. So I think that's that's a good learning for future collaborations. I think um, I would, uh, in retrospect, I should have done some more internal scoping of the requirements to make sure that we supported our, our staff who engaged in, in the real work to have enough time to do that on top of their their day to day activities. Um, I guess in terms of the commitment as well, oh. I think initially there was a little bit of a sense of, well, why are we doing this? Um, our student management system's highly compliant. Um, you know, we're, we're pretty happy with some of the system integration. Um, but over time, I think, and, and Chris, this is probably your observation as well, when if we looked at day one to where we landed at the end, um, the commitment grew because people were engaging with, with like-minded individuals from the other institutions. And I think that sort of um, 
coming together to support and try and find uh, an approach to a common problem really came to the fore. And there was a strong sense of the value of networking, which I think will stand us in good stead into the future. So for instance, I didn't really know Phil before this, you know, um, met him a couple of times, but now if I've got an issue, I'll know I can ring Phil. Same with Jane at Chisholm, you know, so I think it opens up doors as well. So that's really around the value of collaboration and the commitment to that. And working together, you, you can't under estimate the value of it no no I, I think that that's a really good point to pick up on I, I think from almost as a, as that position of observer it's just really easy to see how your respective teams were in the room thought going in that maybe they had a really great process or one that they were really happy with and how they sort of eased over time and, and became a bit more open to to some of the other things that the other institutes might be offering and I think it just took time to actually to, to sort of surface that. And the first meetings were pretty awkward. Um, people not really wanting to give much. Um, and it just became easier the more we went in. And just for reference for the audience, it, it happened over about three or four months. Um, and not too many meetings, but sufficient to make it challenging to, to get the teams together. But certainly from, from that perspective, time in project released a lot of the IP that was just sitting there latent. So that was actually a really interesting observation. Um, just sort of moving on, I think getting on to the good stuff. Um, sort of one of the ways of identifying areas of improvement is to surface the pain points in the journey and, and the stuff that really causes, say, friction in the system. And selfishly, like as a builder of technology, this was the part that carried the most interest for us. It's a privilege anytime you get to hear from customers directly talk about this firsthand. Um, I'm going to share a, a visual aid at the, sort of in a second just to, to say precisely what we landed on. But think of all the, the challenges that the project identified. Um, Phil, maybe if you could share what stood out to you or what you were grappling with as a TAFE and, and why. Yeah, yeah, look, thanks, Chris. Look, we um, experienced a lot of the pain points that um, are on the screen there to some degree. Uh, and I suppose for us too, the pain points were also variable uh, across our own different portfolios within our TAFE, as well as across the TAFEs we, we saw through the project. For example, you know, electrical for us was a little bit different to plumbing, was, uh, was a little bit different to our automotive area. Um, uh, and we've got natural, I suppose, leading and trailing edges in our business. Uh, and a challenge for us is, is around that consistency and experience and the operating model and process and technology. It's always a bit of variation and, and which is challenging at times. Um, for us, I suppose our, our main area, and it's why we've uh, engaged with uh, ReadyTech to some ex uh, extent is, it, it related to some poor platform access, um, integration and automations. Um, you know, there are model as well as being a complex uh, people sort of um, industry uh, apprenticeships. It, there are multiple systems. Uh, you know, the Epsilon, our learning management system, our SMS, and so on and so forth. And, and they're not as well connected as they should be, and so we tend to have some um, quite a number of manual workarounds. Um, and so I suppose starting to look and see with with others about how we could integrate, automate, and uh, digitally connect all those was uh, and is really important um, because that will lead us through to better apprentice tracking advice and reporting to apprentices and our staff and employers um, and then then also being able to analyze the the, um, the data that comes out of that whether it be attendance result patterns and so on and so forth which allows us the ability to provide I think a lot better support um, through the system. So, um, so for us, that was really important. It, it's also important in that response to employers through employer portals, um, in in being able to work with an employer to understand, you know, not uh, uh, reporting six monthly, but reporting as soon as a unit of competency is completed, so that that employer and that apprentice can pretty quickly get down to some practical work uh, having done their TAFE learning and, and TAFE simulation. So for us, it was that that platform access. Um, you know, we've certainly got areas around delays that um, uh, some of those are internally uh, inflicted, some of those are externally uh, inflicted upon us. So um, 
so variable across all, but for us, it, the, the major one was the was the platform access. Yeah, sure, Phil. I think it was interesting just how easy it was to surface pen. Um, you know, I think at all sort of turns there was something that could be improved, which is, I guess, it's it's both a, a, a sort of a risk and an opportunity that that you get to solve for that. And I think one of the things that we really wanted to try and do was. Uh, help develop a roadmap out of that pain. So that was that was an aim of this project was to identify uh, the pain points, but then also like talk to what we would do about them and how we might prioritize going about uh, solving for them. And, and Kathy, it's fair to say you you exper experienced pain too. Um, strange question, but um, maybe can you respond to that? <laughs> I experience pain every day. Um, yeah, look, I'm sure the audience looking at the key pain points on the, the slide deck will, um, you know, tick every one of those if to varying degrees. I thought what was really interesting through the process um, was differing a uh, TAFE approaches to managing the student employer life cycle, whether it's through, you know, communication, engagement, how we um, sign up, enroll, all of that. And some of the pain points identified by, say, Bendigo Kangan Institute or Chisholm, they may have been less so from Melbourne Polytechnic. However, there were other pain points across this visual that were really amplified from Melbourne Polytechnic. So, you know, it was, it was quite interesting. And I think a, a next step would be in terms of how we um, look at the, these varying pain points and determine which are the key ones individual institutes want to tackle, in, you know, with a cost benefit analysis, I guess. But one thing I wanted to talk about, which we see um, almost every day, is, I guess, the limited student and employer um, understanding of the apprentice apprenticeship process. So we look at a lot of things from our TAFE side. We've got our TAFE hat on, and we're not necessarily, necessarily putting ourselves in the shoes of um, you know, the student. And I also think that ineffectual communication across that um, apprentice life cycle, that, that exists on a systemic level. So there's some of the areas that we'd really like to, to focus on um, in terms of you know, moving to this idyllic state of better practice and continuous improvement. Thanks, Kathy. Um, <clears throat> I just stopped sharing the pain points because we're going to move swiftly on. Um, I think the the sort of importance of engagement with employers just it kept coming up, and I think acknowledging where we can really improve servicing those employers because they're so important in both obviously in uh, recruiting and hiring and retaining apprentices but also in in their sort of completion as well they're such an important factor and I think it was identified multiple times that the the way that TAFEs could engage with employers is an area of of improvement so I think from our perspective we have that that view across the whole of the, the apprenticeship journey, managing the, the technology for all stakeholders is, is actually a unique view that, that we have. And it is interesting when you zoom in on just the TAFE portion of it and you understand the constraints that you guys work under and maybe the opportunity there is to better collaborate with say the ASINs or schools or, or whatever else. So I think just in terms of this employer engagement, um, I think, Kathy, anything that you, you kind of want to add? Um, I know you've sort of talked a bit there about it, but maybe the um, the idea of the apprentices as the employers of the future, for example, that relationship you want to build long term, if you maybe want to touch on that. Yeah, so look, it, 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 there's no, um, the employer relationship for TAFE institutes is critical. We all know that. Um, and whilst we invest in it, uh, I think how we, manage that is inconsistent and it's inconsistent across TAFEs but it's also inconsistent in terms of our own departments so you know across an institute that has a, 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 who delivers a range of trade qualifications how plumbing might do it um, would vary in terms of how the electrical department might engage with their employers and I was thinking with just the discussion up to this point I was thinking of our communications last year particularly during COVID where feedback from our employers where they really valued being kept in the loop around you know what workers were permitted to come in this is uh, 
uh, you know, particularly for the uh, Victorian TAFEs, you know, going through lockdowns, yet we were still able to have the apprentices in as uh, permitted workers. Um, we really had to sharpen our pencil in terms of maintaining those communications. And we did it and we did it really well. And the employers are telling us that was fantastic, but it was so manual and it was so contingent on, um, it, it wasn't automated, it was clunky. We got there, but if we were able to do that in a better way and build that in across the whole student journey and the employer life cycle with us, I think would add great value. Um, the other thing I just wanted to say that employers, and Chris, you mentioned it, you know, when an apprentice comes to us, they are an employer of the future. So we want to make sure that we've got that, um, that long relationship with them when an apprentice um, completes their time, you know, that they're part of alumni. So we really talk, talked about that in terms of this um, better practice model. Uh, I think the other thing I, I'd like to say is we have some you know, employers are not homogenous. We've got small employers who might have only one apprentice. We've got large employers who um, are really strong industry partners for us, which we want to um, continue to grow. So I think that relationship is really important on a whole host of levels. Um, so I, I, that's probably as much as I'll it's say. Plenty. It's yeah. plenty. Okay. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to keep a track of time as yep. well. Kathy. Thank you. Um, yep. Thank you. But I think just on that, one of the things that, that really emerged in our discussions was this almost fixation on the idea of self-service and a portal. And I think you've called it out there, Kathy, that the diversity in the stakeholder group that we're talking about, the employers from SMEs all the way through to sort of really large enterprise and corporate em employers, um, a one size fits all, it strikes me from experience is not potentially the right path. And it could be that we need to be a bit more creative in the way that we consider the channels of communication and whether it's direct access through a portal or um, it might be direct to device, it might be just on time notifications, things like that, where a sole trader, a plumber um, gets precisely what they want. And someone who's a dedicated resource managing apprentices at a large mining or resource company has precisely what they need as well. And I think part of our challenge as, as technology providers is to give you what you need to service those in precisely the way that they expect to be serviced. Um, Phil, we, we might skip you, no offense, but I think we just wanna, wanna keep an eye on the clock. So we might just uh, whip through to uh, the next one, but we'll come to you first on this. And just in terms of like looking to the future, cause I think as much as we, we've used the ex existing processes to baseline this project, we always have one eye on the future. We were keen to be aspirational. I think that was part of what we agreed to in the charter. And, I think the future of learning de delivery for apprentices um, might well need to be more flexible. It might need to change. It might need to be more responsive. Um, you know, their flow of work, learning, all of that side of it. Do you, do you want to pick up what that looks like for BKI? Yeah, look, and it was an interesting discussion all the way through with each of the um, TAFEs about how we deal with different client groups and, and, and their different desires. Um, uh, and I suppose for us, the focus has been, uh, we know we can improve. Um, we, we wanted to see a future uh, that really talked to no wait lists. And by no wait lists, I mean no delays or wait lists at any time during the apprentice journey. That's either at the start or during the program. So we understand that in an employer's environment, they will employ an apprentice when their business needs it not at the start of the year, not at the middle of the year and so on and so forth. So um, there is a desire uh, amongst a number of the, uh, the, those employers to, you know, employ in March and start the student a week or two later um, or at any time during the year. So we need to build in a, a model that delivers that, but also a model that delivers with other cohorts where they, they want to march along in a similar frame. So for us, that meant, I suppose, um, moving away from structured terms and semesters and timelines and, and all the students, uh, uh, some, some of the cohorts marching along at the same beat. So um, so if they, they employ today, we can sort of train them tomorrow. And, you know, I think we, we believe this is doable. Um, and certainly also when they come to TAFE and they complete a unit of competency, their TAFE component uh, at three o'clock on Thursday, look at 3.02, they can, 
uh, recommence on a new unit of competency. They don't have to wait around for the other cohort or, or the other members of the group to proceed with them. So, um, it, and if an employer needs a, a student to learn something specific or, or wants to book in for a, uh, for a practical session, then how can we facilitate that with existing classes and existing flexibilities? So it, it's for us, it's about really transitioning to that sort of future. Um, understanding what that looks like, uh, including, you know, great service delivery and performance and putting metrics around that. Um, we, we often hear from employers at different times how, you know, uh, or not often, but we'll hear from an employer every so often about things haven't gone well, or Johnny or Betty have to wait for the rest of the class before they move on. And I, I would love them to learn this skill sooner rather than later. So we need to be able to respond a little bit differently to what we have in the in the sure. past. Um, yeah, I think it's, it's interesting that the responsiveness, the ability to, to get people to competency faster is a hot topic and I'm not qualified to talk to it, so I'm gonna avoid it. Um, but <laughs> Kathy, I'm sure there's some things that, that Melbourne Polytechnic want out of their future vision as well for apprentices and, and maybe you can touch on that and then we'll uh, move to the last topic. Yeah, thank you, Chris. Um, and I'm trying to look at the Q&A as well. Um, I, I guess for us, and Phil's spoken a little bit about it, but that ability to make the sign-off process as easy as possible and uh, links back to what you were saying, Chris, about one employer is not the same as another. Some are happy to log on, but that that um, mobile use of mobile to sign off um, really streamline the process. And what that will do, because it's quite manual at the moment, or if, if we're waiting for an employer to sign off and the student isn't able to, you know, go on to the next stage for whatever reason, it takes a lot of manual intervention, administrative staff phoning up, trying to chase somebody to look at what's sitting in an email. Um, what those pain points mean that we're, we're not getting the value out of some of our resources. And really what we want to do through this is be able to free up resource to do some of those, um, you know, higher value tasks that will enable us to focus on the retention piece and the student experience to do that engagement with the employer for um, other reasons outside of chasing someone. So I think that digitally enabled um, piece is really important as well. Yeah. Um, and, and I just one other point I'd like I'd like to make is it's not like we're, we're not starting from ground zero. So this is all really that um, lockstep continuous improvement. So the artifact or the, the asset that we got at the end of this process is a roadmap. It is aspirational. It's student management system agnostic. Um, and there's a lot of work then to do to, to figure out how do we get there. Um, and I think there will be some strong learnings in that. And can I just, just link to something in the Q&A as well? There was something there from Lance around, have we set targets um, in terms of what would good look like? How do we know when we get there? Um, we haven't gone to that level yet, um, but this is where we're at in terms of, you know, and Chris, you'll talk about the next steps as well, but agreement on is this what a better practice looks like? And then the work to do is how do we get there? Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks, Kathy. Um, yeah, look, I, I think all of that is is really important. I think we're we're probably stage one, and that's what we're talking to today. And um, I think just the idea of collaboration is is what we really wanted to share. I think we may have made it seem like everything went really well. Um, that's not the case. It was hard, um, and from my side of the fence, um, it was hard. But I'm sure for for the taste that the commitment there and taking people offline to, to actually contribute was a, a really major impact. But um, maybe just to wrap up, because we're, we're really short of time, Kathy, Phil, maybe just one of the, the challenges that, that was significant for you um, might, be, uh, might be a good way to end, just on a downer. Oh, look, I mean, the, for me, certainly the, um, we've got long-standing staff with long-standing practices and apprentices is a centuries old sort of um, uh, area so so you know the challenge for them I think coming on board earlier but I think uh, as they moved through it the ability to actually see and work with others um, from across tastes and understand the pain was is a shared pain rather than just their own individual one um, 
and and I think you know uh, it was a pain but and a challenge but a joy. I think being directed by the CEO to on this direction and then allowing this group certainly from our institute back to talk to the CEO multiple times was engaging for them and probably a discussion that they may not have previously had. So just leave it at that for the minute, uh, Cathy. Well, I think in the spirit of openness, I must fess up to the fact that I was available at the start of this project. I took long service in the middle and I came back at the end. So a lot of the work was done. The hard work was done when I'm not around. <laughs> um, but in terms of what was difficult, I don't know if we would have got there without the facilitation and the push through NAS. And of course, with bringing in an external um, support or resource, there is a cost to that. So we, we but at least we had three institutes and um, ReadyTech to support that. But that was a consideration, you know, we won't be able to engage um, an external facilitator every time we want to collaborate. So I think it's really around enhancing our own capacity to do this with, with a good case um, study to, to fall behind. Thanks, Cathy, and thanks for <clears throat> reminding us that the, the work's not yet finished and there's more to do. Um, look, I think that sort of concludes what, what we wanted to share, Jenny. So. Um, I just want to personally thank Kathy and Phil for not just offering their insights today, but for um, engaging in this project in the right spirit and with good humor the whole way through. So, um, yeah, thanks. Thanks to you guys. And also just again, just to, to Chisholm and also Naus who, who facilitated the project as well. Um, it does feel like it's the sort of thing that we could continue and repeat. It wasn't terminal, the experience. And uh, we feel like the value that we, we're deriving with the insights that we're getting and the roadmap that we're able to, to actually capture, we're in a really good position to start to, to actually implement some of that, that improvement. So Jenny, I'll hand back to you for, for Q&A. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Phil. Thank you, Cathy. I actually thought it was fascinating. So um, well done and, and really interesting stuff because I think it's, really pivotal for all of us in TAFE and, and the business of TAFE. So there's been a few questions in the Q&A and um, I, I've picked up a few of those in a broad spirit. So I'm going to um, actually frame a question to each of you, some from some based on the Q&A, some you've already answered. And uh, while one of you is thinking about your answer, we, we might um, uh, get the other to answer. So Cathy, uh, I'll come to you third, but the two things I'd like you to consider, if you wouldn't mind sharing, is what was the cost of your business process change? Have you done any analysis around that? And, and is it a sustainable business process change from, for you? So, so if you think that through, and I think also there was a question from Anne Penn to you, Cathy, that you might like to consider, because you talked a lot about the uh, relationship with the employer. Was there a reaction to increasing the digital component of communication with employers as opposed to face-to-face? -face? So two, those two questions for you, Cathy. Phil, for you, you really struck me when you said no wait lists. Phil, can you tell people, you know, in our audience, um, how did you achieve that? Because I think we know in TAFE one of the big pressure points, and we've, we've got a new TDA network going, which is around attraction of staff, is how are we going to service in those critical industries when we, we're struggling to attract our own qualified staff? What did you mean by no wait list and how did you actually achieve that? So I'll come to you second, Phil, straight after Chris. But Chris, there were quite a few questions there from Kevin uh, around what was happening you know, overseas. Did, you, did, you, did this inform your thinking in the way in which you developed the, and led some of this in terms of what you'd seen overseas. And I, I guess that's the first bit. And, and I really liked your pain point slide. I thought it was so crisp and clear and I thought it really captured things. Where to now? What's your next bit? So yep. you first, Chris, then over to Phil and then to Kathy. Um, okay, in terms of, I, I guess, where you might source the, the best solutions and the best ways of um, these implementing some of these improvements, I think... Um, well, I'm inclined personally not to look inside of education because EdTech is actually comparative to say retail or consumer is way behind. And when you look at the sorts of service design and experience that you might get outside of education, that is barely like you can't compare 
what you would get from a, a retail consumer experience with what you're likely to get inside of education. So often the inspiration from a technology perspective is actually derived outside of education. That's slightly sad. I have to say that in the last 12 to 24 months, there's been a, a real kind of energy in the ed tech startup space and lots of new emerging sort of companies trying to look at specific niche challenges inside of education um, and actually trying to solve for those. So our position as a, as a technology provider is that we might not necessarily solve it all. And we've got a, a fairly large strategy that's, that's effectively an ecosystem strategy that looks to connect our customers with the partner value, strategic alliances through partners that bring their IP to, to bear on, on our customers through integration. I think for us, um, Phil's touched on it a lot that the, the data flows, and I think there's a, a question maybe in the Q&A, like it's, um, it's an imperfect solution that we exist with at the moment. So typically, especially in apprenticeships, there's that, the same data exists in multiple systems and they're not particularly well integrated. We can really make a, a fist of, um, of improving that. I think, say for example, that fee from Epsilon, um, one of the, the things that came up time and again was having a line of sight on the, um, prospects. So a training contract's been signed, it exists in, in say, ADMS and um, in uh, something like Epsilon in Victoria, and yet the TAFE doesn't know about it or isn't aware of it early enough or soon enough. So there's no line of sight on their numbers. So things like that are eminently solvable, and I think we can. Um, the second part of the question, if you remind me, Jenny, what it was, because I'm sort of aging and I've forgotten what the second part was. Oh, what, what's the next step? Sorry, that... Yeah. I, I remember just in time. Look, the next steps, um, we're in conversation at the moment. The asset's been produced and it's with the CEOs for review and approval. So that's kind of where we're at. I think one of the questions is, is this asset available? Um, once it's been uh, approved, um, we think it will be fair to share. I don't think anything in there is um, you know, IP protected or anything like that. I think we want to share. I think that's the spirit of collaboration. It'd be hard to talk about collaboration and then not do this. So um, once that's gone through the right channels, um, we'll look to share and we'll, we'll likely share it through you guys, Jenny. So um, come back to TDA for more details. And I think for us, we know that there's more work to do to, to refine and, and fine tune that the things that we've surfaced, it's not over. There's more work to do. And then it's a further commitment from the CEOs and, and we'll work out what, what to do next. But it'll likely be a, another project of a similar size and scale, we, we guess. Thanks, Chris. And I think that question in the TDA was there, is the Victorian government involved? Well, my understanding of this, it was led by the executive of three tapes, in particular in Victoria. Uh, and, and that's Phil's representing um, Bendigo Kangan, Cathy Melbourne Polytechnic yep. and Chisholm was involved. And that was the collaboration. So it wasn't actually government led. It was led by the organisations desiring to improve both the student experience and the employer experience. Is, is that, that that's... No, no, yeah. I, I, that's absolutely right. I think, you know, it's incumbent on us to, to lead on these things. I think yeah. um, government will will always um, have an absolute role to play in the way that, that TAFE um, is uh, rolled out and the way it improves over time. But we, we can do some of this ourselves. We can actually take the responsibility on ourselves, um, provided it doesn't conflict or, or contradict any of those those things that government's trying to achieve I think we you know we have a responsibility to improve all the time it's never over I think Kathy said it's not best practice it's just better practice because yeah. you're constantly working on it and and the fact that you're prepared to share so openly in a forum like this is is of great value to the broader network so um yeah I think you're absolutely right I don't there, think Chris. anyone's under the illusion that we're perfect Jenny I think we're, no. we and we look forward <laughs> We look forward to having you back next year to talk further because I think there's a lot of people who'd be interested. Over to you, Phil, now. The whole question yep. around how you achieve no wait lists, I'm intrigued. So tell us more. Well, look, uh, I suppose where we've done it most successfully is in our automotive area. Um, and, and the reality is that uh, an employer employs, uh, as soon as you do a lot of the, um, uh, the paperwork, the contracts, the negotiated training plan, uh, we still commit to a visit, a, a, a physical visit to an employer. We see that really is important. Um, uh, and, you know, as we found out through COVID face and uh, there's a mixture of face and, and digital. So as soon as we do that, that we, we then sign up an individual um, uh, and we have them connected to our digital hub. And within that, they can then immediately commence once their payments, once, once that sort of element is done, they can actually 
develop some of their theoretical courseware um, and, and complete that. The beauty of that is also then getting whoever is the supervisor within the business uh, to, to see and view that. Um, and with some of them, uh, we, we've got a, a certainly agreements that unless Johnny won't come to the TAFE practical component, unless 95%, you know, they've signed off 95% of that theoretical element so that we don't have to reteach them again. We also then have some large digital hubs within our, our TAFE campus. So we'll, we'll have 40 or 50 students. So we'll have, uh, for automotive in particular, we'll have uh, light vehicle mechanics, heavy diesel, paint panel, trimmers, uh, the whole range. And they will come and those areas will be staffed by one or two experts. Students then can continue that digital theory work. And then from there, they actually book their time uh, directly from there into a practical room. So getting them commenced on a number of units early it has for us been a real positive. Uh, it's also grown our numbers in that um, an employer can understand we can do this at any time. Yeah. We, we can start as soon as possible. So it's that mixture of um, digital. Of course, some people need assistance or, uh, and some are unassisted and some can work uh, quite quickly. And given, look, the average age now of, of apprentices, certainly in our area is about 22. They're more mature in, in some respects. Some might argue that, but um, th they are a little bit more digitally uh, enabled. So we've found that by connecting to a supervisor, a mentor within the business, getting them onto their digital hub as quickly as possible, getting them started even before they come in, they start to really understand and, and accelerate their learning. Uh, I'd also go to one or two questions in the, uh, TAFEs can't, uh, can't legislate the HR requirements around um, time served and so on and so forth. We can assist in, in uh, the learning, uh, uh, maybe accelerating some of that, but, it's probably not an area that the TAFEs, uh, I would never go to an employer and say, look, Johnny should complete in two years or, or so on and so forth. That's a different discussion. Thanks, Phil. We do have to remember our apprenticeship system is very linked to industrial relations. And I think you highlighted <laughs> that very so. well. So, but thank you about your wait list. I thought that was fantastic, you, that portal approach. Kathy, over to you then. A quick question. How did you deal with the employers in terms of the digital versus face-to-face -face and then and then just in, a, in about a minute, uh, what business process change for staff? Okay, well, I might actually start with the business process piece. Um, so this is phase one. We've, the NAS group um, presented uh, the asset back to our chief executives only on Monday. So they're considering that. The next steps in the project, should we proceed is we agree, uh, this is what better or best practice looks like. And then the work will start in terms of in, uh, whether we, and again, it might be a conversation, Phil, Chris, and with, with Chisholm, in terms of the gap analysis, each individual institute will need to then look how far away are we from this best practice model if, if when we get endorsement for that. And that's where we will determine, um, you know, the business process enhancements that would need to take place and do the cost benefit uh, analysis around that. So there's still a lot of work to be done. Um, and then the, the other question was around, uh, well, there's two things I'll quickly say around the communications. Um, we focused internally on gathering data on these pain points. We have to validate the findings, and that's something that we're all very keen to do with employers and student focus groups. So we get the full 360. At the moment, this is our view of what good looks like. So I think that's important to note. And then in terms of that communication process, we're... Um, We've we've all got communication strategies that we you know we try and stick to and make sure that wh whoever you are that we're communicating with you get timely information when you need it if there's a call to action that's really clear what this um, process is talking about is really making that as seamless as possible so um, you know it's not like we haven't communicated to people in the past it's again that continuous improvement and um, what we're saying in this process and project is there might be better ways to do that more efficiently to free up resource to do other things that might be of a higher value in, in terms of the student and employer experience. Thanks, that's a great comment. So you, you get that digitised regular communication, allowing you a more valuable time in more deep communication uh, in different contexts. Yeah. Thanks very much, Cathy.
Um, I want to thank all our three uh, guests today on TAFE Talks. Uh, and, on, and, I, and at the end of this, I'll just hand across to Chris for any final comment. To Cathy Fraser, Phil Murphy from our two TAFEs in Victoria, thank you so much for your contribution today. Fantastic. I learned a lot. I'm pretty sure everybody else did as well. Chris Smith from Ready Tech, we really appreciate you taking the lead here to initiate and get this going today. And final words to you, Chris. Thanks, Jenny. Um... Look, I just wanted to say thanks to the, the guys again, Kathy and Phil, um, Jen and the team, and, and also Jenny to you, just for bringing us all together and giving us a platform to share. I think collaboration would have only existed inside the, the three institutes and us were it not for this. So thanks so much for the opportunity, Jenny. Thank you all. That's it from Tape Talks for this month. Bye now. Thank you. Bye.